Hey, well, good morning, and welcome to Wellspring Church, uh, where we exist to connect people to Christ, who is the wellspring of life. Uh, if we have not had a chance to meet, my name is Cameron. I am one of the pastors here uh, on staff, and I am grateful to be able to speak to you today from uh, the Word. I just want you to know, uh, look out and I kind of see a sense of who's here. Uh, I just want you to know that whoever you are and wherever you are, you are welcome here with us. Uh, we are a mix of people. We are people who are all on a journey of faith, a journey of faith toward Jesus. And we are all uh, imperfectly in pursuit to live a life of obedience and love that Christ has exampled and modeled for us. So wherever you are on that journey, uh, you're welcome here. And we hope that you feel welcomed and we hope you feel loved. So welcome to church. Uh, we, we're glad that you're here. Um, if you got your Bible, open it up to Matthew chapter 10. That's where we're going to be today. Uh, over the last couple of weeks, we have been in a teaching series called As You Go. Uh, we started out with Jesus' words to his 12 disciples saying, he's, he's calling them out by name, and he's saying, I am sending you out. I am calling you by name. I am going to equip you with power to go and to proclaim the gospel. So he looks at them, he says this, and then week two we saw, I'm sending you out, and it is not going to be easy. The path and the places where I'm calling you to go, it's going to be a difficult ride. Your faith is going to be challenged. And so we pick it up today in Matthew chapter uh, 10, verse 26, where Jesus is saying, yes, it is going to be difficult. It is going to be a challenge. Uh, but do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. And so let's read together. If you would, would you stand with me? We're going to read from God's word. Listen to the words of Jesus. He says, So do not be afraid of them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed, or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both the soul and the body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside of your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So do not be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. God, we thank you for your son uh, who enables us to live fearlessly. God, would you teach us? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, please take a seat. So I grew up in my family, had a couple of siblings. Um, <laughs> my family's laughing because I told them I would throw in a couple of family stories. So here you get one for free. Uh, I had an older brother, and I had two younger sisters. Uh, any of you grew up with an older brother? Any of you, are you an older brother? Uh, maybe this will be a little bit relatable. Um, I was, must have been about five, and my brother was probably about, he's four years older than me, so he's about nine years old. Uh, we went to church. My parents took us to church. And my brother, he had a friend, and his friend had a younger brother. They liked to mess with us from time to time. And so while we were at church, my nine-year-old brother took my five-year-old self into the bathroom. And he said, Cameron, did you know that you can get flushed down the toilet? And I said, no, I did not know that. That is terrifying. And I probably didn't say it quite like that, but I was like, what? What? What are you talking about? And so my brother goes into the bathroom stall. He then flushes the toilet and makes these little sounds, and he starts to scream as, he is, as if he is getting flushed down the toilet. I'm outside of the stall. I'm freaking out. So what do I do? Like, my brother just got flushed down the toilet. I open up the stall, and he's gone. He's not there. He has been flushed down the toilet. So I run out of the bathroom, and my, where did my brother go? He did this to me multiple times during my childhood, convincing me that you could get flushed down the toilet. He would go, he'd go in, he'd flush the toilet, he'd go under the stall, he'd stand up on the seat of the next stall, I'd look under, there's no feet anywhere, Preston's gone, he's been flushed down the toilet. So my brother made me believe that you could get flushed down the toilet. 
and I was terrified. You see, uh, there are many different kinds of fear in life. There's the kind of fear that you can feel as a child when everything in the world is new and marvelous and unknown and just the sheer terror that you could be flushed down the toilet. There's that kind of fear. Uh, there's the kind of fear of spiders and of heights. Uh, there is the fear of failure, which drives us to unhealthy levels of competition. There is the fear of not being enough, uh, which fills us with depression and anxiety and a continual presence of comparison in our lives. Um, I am a recent dad. I just had a kid. Yeah. Hey. hey. And I'll be honest, I'm a, I was a little afraid at a couple of points. Um, you know, you go into the hospital and this is, you know, when this is your first time, everything's new and I don't know what's happening and needles are being poked and there's all this stuff happening. But then you have a kid and it's amazing and it's like this big and you can't hardly pick it up. You think you're going to break it and you sit in the hospital for a couple of days and then they tell you you get to go home. And you're like, really? I'm like, you're going to let me take this home. Like, what if I drop it, you know? What, what do you do? What do you, what do you do with it? <laughs> and so there's many different kinds of fear. And it's something that we all have in common is fear. Uh, fear, in fact, is very normal. It is normal. And I want to give you permission. It is okay to be afraid. But sometimes as followers of Christ, Jesus is asking us to feel the fear, but to fight for faith to feel the fear and to fight for faith. So today, as we look at the word, I want us to talk openly and honestly about what scripture says and to look at the words of Christ and consider what he says in Matthew chapter 10 and listen to his arguments for why we as believers should not be afraid. Uh, before we do that, I wanna read from Psalm 23. Psalm 23 says this, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the shadow of the valley of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I, uh, I love this psalm. It's, com it's been a comfort to me in many times and many spaces in my life, and it's probably been the same for you. But let's have the honest part of the conversation. You see, often Jesus is calling us to walk down paths of righteousness. And those paths of light righteousness will lead us straight through the valley of the shadow of death. But what does he say? He says that we are not to be afraid because he is with us. So being on this journey with Jesus, being people who are sent as a byproduct of that, sometimes that means that we need to leave safety and security behind to go to the places that he has called us to go. And sometimes that means fear is a natural byproduct of this. Yet Christ knows this. That's why he tells us, do not be afraid for I will be with you. Even though I walk through the valley. I will not fear, for you are with me. And just as Jesus is calling his disciples to do, this is, this is exactly what Jesus is calling his disciples to do in Matthew chapter 10. He tells them that I am sending you out in power. I am equipping you for the mission. It is gonna be difficult, but do not be afraid. You see, Jesus knows that what he's asking his disciples to do can be scary. And so, he backs up this command to not be afraid with at least three arguments in these six verses. Three times he says, do not be afraid, do not be afraid, do not be afraid. And he gives a defense to why this is so. And so I want us to look at these one by one and see what Jesus says. 
in the scripture and in verse 25 and 26, I'm gonna back it up, just one verse, so we can get a sense of this first argument. And here is what Jesus says. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the servant to be like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they malign those of his household? So do not be afraid of them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. Okay, so got to be honest, this first argument is a little confusing. I had to sit here for a while to understand what Jesus is talking about. And so let's do some work, and we're going to see what Jesus is teaching. So in the ancient Near East, at this time, Beelzebub was another name that the people would have for Satan or the devil. And so what is Jesus saying? He is saying, they have called me Beelzebub. What do you think that they are going to call you? I am the teacher. You are my students. Uh, They think that I am the devil because of the miracles that I performed. And so if I have done this, if this is what they have called me, what do you think they are going to call you? If they speak poorly of me, you can expect them that they will speak poorly of you. So don't be afraid. And I kind of go, okay. They speak poorly of you. They're going to speak poorly of me. I don't, why, why is that an argument that I should not be afraid? That doesn't exactly fill me with courage. Jesus follows it up. He says, so do not be afraid, for there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed and hidden that will not be made known. So if we back it up to the beginning of this chapter, do you remember what Jesus said? In verse 7, when Jesus is calling his disciples, he's telling them that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He is saying, right now, these people do not know who I am. Right now, these people do not know in whose name I do these things. And so they are afraid. You see, to be maligned by the world means to be in good company with Jesus. To be maligned by the world means to be in good company with Jesus. And you want to be in good company with Jesus. Because when you are in good company with Jesus, that means that you are under the watchful protection of the good shepherd. Yes, there are wolves, but he has a rod and a staff, and they are a comfort to me. So all that is hidden will be made known. We know who Jesus is. We know what he has done. We rest in that. When we do, that gives us comfort and peace. And one day, the world will know. People will know. And we will be vindicated. Those who speak poorly of us, those who malign us, will no longer one day. When all things are made clear and all things are made known. So when they do, just know and rest hey, this is the same thing that they've done to Jesus. They will do it to you, but that is okay, because when they do, we are in good company with Jesus. So second argument, verse 28. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both the soul and the body in hell. So what is Jesus saying? What is Jesus saying? Here's how I said it in your notes. We are to live with an eternal perspective. We're to live with an eternal perspective. Do you know what fear is? We've all experienced it, but you know what fear is. Fear is a physiological reaction that happens in our brain. It's God-given, and it tells us when we are in danger. So in, in a way, fear is good. Fear is helpful for self preservation. Um, This week, I did a Google search on fear. Nothing has changed. Fears are all still the same. People are afraid of public speaking. People are afraid of spiders and heights. And people are afraid of spiders, heights, public speaking. list goes on and on and on. Uh, So yeah, that's the list. Who, uh, (laughs) who's afraid of those things? Anybody? Those things make it onto your list. Uh, What about spiders? Anybody afraid of spiders? I'm a little curious. 
Not a lot of men raising their hands in the room. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll say this. I'm not, I'm not like afraid of spiders, right? But when my wife tells me to go and kill a spider, I'm bringing a shoe and I'm bringing some paper towels. I'm not just gonna walk up on this spider and just like grab it with my bare hands and smush it and then eat it. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not gonna do that. I'm bringing a shoe, I'm bringing some paper towels. Uh, anybody know the show Peppa Pig? Anybody got kids? They made a sh- any, did you hear what happened with Peppa Pig? There was an episode that they made a long time ago that taught children that they should not be afraid of spiders. They should not be afraid of spiders. Basically, the episode said spiders are very, very small and they can't hurt you. At the end of the episode, they actually brought the spider up into the bed and they made the spider some tea and they gave the, sp- the spider tea. This is a very cute children's show. Don't be afraid of spiders, all right? Well, ironically, they actually had to pull the episode in Australia because in Australia, spiders are in fact not very, very small. They can be very, very big and they can be very, very dangerous. And they send thousands of people to the hospital every year. Spiders in Australia, you know, and spiders the size of your face. <laughs> so fear, a little bit of fear is okay, all right? A little bit of fear is what keeps us alive. Uh, It is helpful for self-preservation. You know what also makes its way onto the list of fears? Death and dying. That's a thing that people are afraid of. So what do you do when the thing you fear isn't a spider? What if it is death itself? You see, Jesus is sending out the disciples. He's telling them, I am sending you out among wolves. He's telling them uh, that they might die, but do not be afraid. Why can Jesus say this? Jesus can say this because he more than most, more than anyone, is the eternal son of God. He has an eternal perspective. He doesn't see things the way we see them. He sees things from a God perspective, a God point of view. Jesus had an eternal perspective. And so hopefully for us, when we can take a step back from our lives and we can look at the things that we are afraid of and we can look at the things that we're doing, hopefully we can see that the things that matter most are the things in our life that make an impact for eternity. You know the difference, right? Every day we wake up, we make decisions Some of those decisions are here and now oriented. Some of them are future oriented. And if we're doing, if we have our priorities straight, we will see that the future oriented, eternal minded decisions that we make in our lives are the ones that are most important. They are the ones that leave with an eternal, that leave us with an eternal perspective. But the problem is we have a tendency that when we are not paying attention that there is a Christian atheist in us that takes over the day-to-day decision-making of our life. And this Christian atheist that is in us makes decisions without any regard for God or the reality that there is more to life than the things that are right in front of us. And so many of us are not stepping into the power and the purpose that God has for our life because we are too afraid and too busy with the temporary and we're too fearful for what it might cost and we don't wanna think about the big eternal decisions because we're afraid. But listen, God wants more for your life than for you to be focused only on the temporary, only on what is right in front of you. We are more than physical. We are body and we are soul and we were made to live forever. So to live a life of power and purpose and presence means that we need to move beyond our desires for the temporary, for the here and for the now, and to be filled with a passion to be a part of God's eternal mission. We are people who have been sent. We've been sent. We've been sent around the world. We've been sent into our homes and our neighborhoods. God is sending you, and he has already sent you. So 
We do not fear those who can kill the body because we know there's more to life than the physical. And we have entrusted our souls to the good shepherd who leads us in paths of righteousness. And even when the path of righteousness leads us through the valley, we're not afraid because we know that we are eternally safe with him. Okay, last thing. We're not afraid because we are not alone. You hear me? We are not alone. Verse 29 and 31. Here's what it says. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside of your father's care. And even the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So do not be afraid, for you are worth more than many sparrows. If I could explain the story simply, I might say it like this. God is in control of all things. He knows you and your life matters to him. God is in control of all things. He knows you and your life matters to him. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? God takes notice of every individual little sparrow, creatures that are seemingly insignificant and numerous, yet not one of them falls to the ground apart from the Father's care. And even the hairs on your head are all numbered. Does anybody in here know how many hairs are on your head? I mean, maybe with the exception of a few of us who, you know, a little bit easier to count that number. <laughs> hey, why would, but why would we know? Nobody knows. You can't count the numbers of hair. I guess theoretically you could if you had enough patience and a microscope, maybe. But why would you need to know that? Why would you need to know the number of hairs on your head? You don't, but God does. God knows. In fact, the verb here for God knowing the hairs on your head is in the perfect tense, which means that God is continually knowing. He is continually knowing the numbers of hairs on your head. He is keeping track. Every time that you wake up and you brush your hair and hair falls out, God is keeping account and he is keeping record of the number of hairs on your head. You see, God knows you. God knows everything about you. He knows what is going on in your life and in your world. He sees. God knows you. And he cares for you. Because God is not so busy running the universe that he has no time for little birds. And by that, by, that, by extension, it means that he's not so busy that he does not have time for you. See, he cares about you. Our all-knowing, all-powerful God, he has all the time in the world. He invented it. He exists outside of it. And our God watches over every sparrow. And how much more will he watch over you who are made in his image, his children? So what do we have to fear? And somebody needs to hear that today. Because we know this in our head. We know that God sees and cares about people in general. God cares about somebody. God cares about them. I can see it in their life. But we've never come face to face with him and realize the fact that God cares for you. It's not just other people. It's not just an idea. But God knows what is going on in your life. God knows you, and he cares for you. Your life is of significance, and it matters to him. And so, for these reasons, one, two, and three, fear has no place in the life of the believer. But you see, there is actually more to living a life of power and of purpose and of presence than just not being afraid. As I've said, we are people who are sent. What does it say in verse 27? What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. So we are not afraid. We are not alone. So what do we do? We shine the light. We shine the light. 
what I speak to you in darkness, say in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. As people of God, perfectly loved, perfectly known, we have been sent into a world that is sometimes very dark. And we have been sent to shine a light. And we do so without fear. So that when the world gets darker, we can shine brighter. You see, we as a people, as a church, this is what we do. We come together every week and we gather together in this place. And that is a very good thing. But we are more than just a people who gather here. We are a people who have been sent out there to live our faith every day. Our faith is not just a once a week kind of faith. Our faith is meant to be an everyday kind of faith. So as we go, we are called to be people who bring the light into darkness. We are called to offer words of hopeless, of hope to the hopeless. And we can offer faith to those who are paralyzed by fear. We are called to do this in our homes and at our work at our schools, around the world, and across the street to our neighbors. Um, speaking of our neighbors, um, I actually had a neighbor who passed away recently. Um, it was very sad. Her name was Nancy. She was very sweet. Um, Nancy was in the twilight years of her life. She lived alone. Her kids lived far across the country. Uh, a few, I think maybe two years ago, I took over some cookies and a Wellspring card, gave it to her, invited her to come to Christmas Eve service with us. Uh, she wasn't able to make it, uh, so I was bummed about that, but she seemed very grateful, very thankful. Um, but that was, for the most part, I, that was kind of one of the last times I talked to Nancy until uh, about a month ago, Nancy came over to my door, which was a surprise. Nancy didn't get out too much, but she came over to my door. She knocked on the door, and she asked me if I could help her with her computer. She said she needed a computer wizard. Um, she just needed help getting her email, you know, on her phone and those kinds of things. And so I told her, I was like, well, you know, I, I, I do some of those things and I could probably help you with that. And so um, I went over to her house and we sat down for a while. I talked to Nancy, you know, she asked me what I did. I told her I was a pastor at a church down the street. Um, we talked a little bit about faith. She Little, little uneasy, but still very receptive. Um, and I remember sitting with Nancy and thinking to myself, gosh, I need to invite Nancy to come to church. I need to invite Nancy to come to church. But I didn't. I didn't invite Nancy to come to church. And I'm not sure if it was the, f the fear of making the situation awkward or overstepping because this was the first time I had been invited to somebody's home. But I, I, ultimately, I decided, you know what? Like, this won't be the last time. I'll see Nancy again. I'll do it next time. Next time I'm at her home, next time I'm helping with her computer, I'll invite her next time. I don't know. So, okay. So that's what I thought. Um, a few weeks go by. Another lady comes to my door, and she says... Hey, I, do you know your neighbor across the street, Nancy? Um, she goes to my gym. I haven't seen her in a while, and I'm a little concerned. And so I haven't, no, I told her, I was like, no, I, ha I actually haven't seen Nancy in, in a little while. Um, I don't know what's going on. Why don't we go check? Um, she said nobody was at the door. Nobody answered. We walked around the neighborhood. Sure enough, we found out from another neighbor that about a week prior to that, Nancy had been in a car accident, and Nancy had passed away. I don't know if Nancy was a believer. I never got to have the conversation. I, I debated whether or not to, to tell that story. Um, it's a little sad. <laughs> but I imagine that there are a lot of Nancys in the lives of people in this room, a lot of people who you know who need a little bit of hope, who need a little bit of light in the darkness. And so for their sake, I hope that we can be a people who are sent, 
I hope that we can be a people who speak boldly about what we believe, people who are not afraid. So um, at Wellspring, we want to preach uh, the gospel and the Bible clearly, and we want to give you some space to respond and give your soul some space to respond. So I'm going to invite the band to come up, and uh, we're going to have a time of prayer. The band's going to begin to play, uh, pray. You can join them in some singing in a moment if that helps you in a kind of a prayer exercise. If you would, would you just bow your head with me?